Now we're going to move on to prompting and scaffolding. We all have routines and procedures in our classrooms, and we all have a few students who we spend more time with because they just don't follow those procedures. So now that you have your task analysis created and you've determined which training procedure you will use, how are you going to teach it? Well, we have some strategies for prompting and scaffolding for you. But first, I want to point out that when you plan for prompting, you should also plan for fading. You should come up with that plan at the onset. You always want to have that plan in place. We want to fade as soon as possible. So how are you going to know? When is it time? You have to collect data. You have to evaluate that data. Are they moving forward quickly? Keep dropping those prompts to a lesser level. If they stalled, stop, drop, and assess. Maybe you find that there are three adults in the classroom and they're doing three different types of prompt fang, fading, three different levels, um, or three different strategies. That's going to be very confusing to a student. So make sure that you look at all of those different scenarios if you have a student that stalls. And then remember to reinforce heavily when students are even a tiny step more independent than they were. And that can include an approximation. Maybe they didn't complete the whole skill, but they did a little bit more than they did the day before. Make a big deal out of that. So the closer they get to independence, the better they are going to perform on a task analysis. This graphic shows the types of prompts that you might see, and it kind of gives a general flow of how they might work. So typically you see a hierarchy as an up, down, triangle type thing. But if you notice here, um, it is still a continuum. You've got the flow from left to right. And if you notice, the cars are going both directions. So you can flow up back and forth across this continuum as you need to for teaching a student a specific skill. So if you've looked up prompting hierarchies before, you probably know that there are a lot of different ones out there. Well, that's because there really isn't a one-stop shop out there. It depends on the skill they're working on and the student's individual skills. So when we want to consider prompting, make sure that you're thinking about an individual student because they might have different prompts, prompt types. And the goal of using a prompt is always to get your student to the correct answer with as little intrusion as possible. So here is an example of how you could fade prompts. This would be a most to least fade. Um, like I said earlier, prompts are not meant to be permanent. Have you ever worked with a student that is prompt dependent? You present a direction to them and maybe they like hold their hand up and wait for you to take their hand and move their arm through the actions. Their prompts didn't get faded fast enough. So that's why we need to plan for fading at the onset. So with most to least, you would want to use this kind of a fading process when the student lacks the skills to complete the task. They just don't know how yet. And so if we're looking at this, the way it's set up on there, you would begin with most to least at full physical. And that would consist of a teacher placing his or her hands under the learner's hand to guide the learner through the initial training trials. It's really important that we are transitioning to under the learner's hand instead of hand over hand, like we did in the past. It's 
less intrusive and you're not forcing compliance when your hand is underneath theirs. You are making the motions for them, but they're following along with you. They have a say in that. Perhaps then you move down to a physical and then verbal, and then you flow all the way down through there. So let's look at it and think about an example of this. So let's say we're talking about teaching a child to take a bite with a spoon. So for full physical, you might fully assist the student. You're going to grasp that spoon and their hand's going to be over yours. Scoop the food, bring it up to the child's mouth. Now, you're not going to open their mouth. We don't do that. Uh, we hope that when the spoon gets up there, they open their mouth and take a bite. Uh, but if they don't, we're not going to physically make their mouth come open. Um, so just a note about that. Say they are doing well with that. We want to move to a partial. So maybe we just touch their elbow lightly. And it reminds them that they need to reach their hand forward and pick up that spoon. And then they go through the rest of the steps on their own. With verbal, a lot of times we are using verbal with these other prompts, but a better method for most tasks would be to use a visual when we can instead of verbal. But verbal has its place. So here you could just say, use your spoon to take a bite. Modeling, you're just gonna pick up the spoon, model scooping it and taking it to your mouth. Of course, we're not gonna eat their food or put it in our mouth, but you're showing them all of the steps that you can. Gesture, you point to the spoon, they pick it up, you point to the food, they scoop it, they bring it to their mouth. And visuals, you could have a mini schedule that shows all of the steps that you need to complete to take a bite with a spoon. And then independent would be placing that food item and spoon in front of the child and that child responds independently. And so if you see over there on that right side, we have independent with visuals, but then we also have visuals as the lowest or least intrusive prompt. The reason is because we all use visuals every day. We may not need them to complete a task, but that doesn't mean they're not there. Think about road signs. Uh, I walked into a Chick-fil-A a few months ago and in the Chick-fil-A bathroom, they had a hand washing task analysis above the sink for their staff. Does everyone need that? No, but they might have some people that do. So if they need that, visual to complete it, it is a visual prompt. If it's just there and they don't need it, don't count that against them. We don't count it against ourselves. And now let's talk about least to most. So least to most is another way that you can fade prompts. And this is where you're going to start with the least amount of intrusion as possible. And this is really a great strategy for students that know how to complete the skill, but they're not doing it. And so you're kind of looking at motivation here. So let's do an example of opening a locker. Now there are different types of locks, but for our example, we are going to do the combination lock underneath the fingerprint lock. So for an example, if you are doing this combination lock, your first is going to be a visual. And so maybe you have their code written on a card. Maybe it has arrows, but that's not working. So you're going to go up to a gesture and your visual. And so maybe you're pointing which direction they turn the combination. A model, of course, you're just going to show them how. A verbal, you're going to tell them, turn the knob left, stop, or whatever kind of lock it is, you would use those directions. Partial physical. Maybe you tap or touch the back of their hand when they should stop turning. And then for full physical, you are hand under hand assisting them in opening that combination lock. And quickly, 
we wanted to take just a couple of minutes and talk about scaffolding. Scaffolding is a support provided to students who are struggling to master a concept. And when you're scaffolding instruction, educators break those tasks down into smaller, more manageable steps. Does that sound familiar? Well, that's exactly what we've been talking about with task analysis. And once you have those tasks or skills broken down into chunks, you're re-examining that zone of proximal development, right? The gap between where the student is and where the student needs to be, where you want them to be. And then you're going to design those supports and prompts to help the students close that gap. And just like those prompts, we have to fade scaffold so students can be independent. We wanted to bring some scaffolding into the training here because it is a high leverage practice for one, but also because it's a concept used in a lot of general education environments. And special educators are more likely to use the phrases task analysis and prompting. And so these are very, very similar instructional strategies. And we wanted to take this opportunity to make that connection for teachers. So scaffolding comes right alongside task analysis and prompting. And there are great strategies to support explicit instruction in those classroom procedures and routines. Really quickly, here's an example of an instructional routine. It's a graphic organizer. So there's a, a sequence that you're going to want students to follow, and then they would fill this out to compose a product. It's a visual prompt. If you're expecting students to include a certain item in their composition, you could use a task analysis and a data sheet to determine if a struggling student is in need of some more support completing the activity. And again, I'm gonna point out that the data sheet, it's so valuable in pinpointing where the student is experiencing some barriers. And once we find that, then we can think about how we can support them in mastering that skill.